Aaron Alston's original plan for the Race Squadron books wouldn't have involved Race Squadron at all. He wanted to set it at the same time as Michael A. Stackpole's Rogue Squadron books, and it would have followed Wes Jansen and Hobby Clivian and the training squadrons that they undertook at the time. However, Lucasfilm still wanted a focus on Wedge, which is how we got the Race Squadron books being set after the events of the Bacta War during the search for Warlord Zinge. While I could find New York Times bestseller data for the first book, Wraith Squadron, I couldn't find anything that showed that Iron Fist, on the other hand, made the New York Times paperback bestseller list for any of the weeks after its release. So mostly what I remembered from Iron Fist was the face and Ton Fanon subplot. Some of the stuff that I thought happened in Iron Fist, specifically with Lara Knotsil, actually happened in the next book, Solo Command. So I both found what I was expecting and was a little surprised that some of the things I associated with this book were actually from a later one. So a brief summary. Against all odds, Race Squadron has survived its first covert mission, but Wedge Antilles has more things in store for them, this time to uncover where Warlord Zinge and his Super Star Destroyer Iron Fist are based. So posing as pirates, the race aim to infiltrate Zinge's mission and leak vital information back to General Solo. So what I really like about the Race Squadron books is that Alston doesn't just focus on the same characters in each book. In book one, we really focus on Kel Tainer a lot. And in Iron Fist, we've picked up some more characters to focus on, both original race from the first book and some new introductions to the cast. So on the Wedge Antilles front, Wedge's major conflict is that at the very end of the battle in Race Squadron, they heard the voice of Baron Fell, who had been an Imperial pilot. He defected to the New Republic. He then vanished, presumably back into the Empire. And he just happens to be Wedge's brother-in-law because he's married to Wedge's sister, Sial. So most of what Wedge is dealing with is why would Fel join Zinge? What does that offer him? Is his sister still alive? Is she still well? What does he think of Wedge? While we don't really get a resolution for there, it does seem that Fel, while previously having really good feelings about Wedge, is now very dismissive of him in a way. So that's mostly what Wedge is working through here. Also, more of Wedge being the boss, Wedge having to deal with almost troublesome teenagers in a way, who have to be reprimanded, have to be told no, and in the case of Cast and Dawn, don't always listen. While Face, Lauren, got a fair bit of development in Race Squadron, he gets even more in Iron Fist. Alston had said in interviews that one of the main themes he saw for the Race Squadron books was the concept of forgiveness. In Race Squadron, it's Wedge and Cal Tainer having to learn to forgive themselves in the matter of Jesmyn Akbar's death. Kel takes it even further. He has to learn to forgive and forget both his father's heritage and how that affects him. So with Face, we have a character who was a child actor for the Empire, joined the New Republic, but can't seem to forgive himself for what he did. Anton Fanon's subplot is directly tied into Faces, because in a way, Ton and Face are the same. They're both really struggling with things, but in the case of Ton, it's that he's given up. And Face has to learn not to give up, that yes, he unwittingly or not was a part of something horrible, but he was a child. You can't judge a child in the same way that you judge an adult. So Face is almost self-flagellating himself over his involvement in Imperial propaganda films, and refusing to get rid of his facial scar is one aspect of that. So he has to learn that he has things worth living for, he's doing good, he doesn't have to beat himself up over his past, and he can move beyond that. 
And then with the addition of more race, we also get interesting plays on that theme. With Dia Pasik, the Twi'lek, she was taken as a slave as a child, and in joining the New Republic military, she's almost bloodthirsty. There are points in the book where the race are on missions, and it just doesn't make sense to kill Imperials, get those ships out of action, and keep on going. But Dia, because of her background, because of her childhood, feels that being heartless is the only way that she can survive. She doesn't want to be the weak child slave that she was, so she takes it to the opposite extreme. And events happen to make her have to seriously rethink that outlook and change how she approaches things. Lara Notzel, on the other hand, who we previously knew in Race Squadron as Gara Petithel, originally joins Race Squadron as a temporary thing. She wants to get back to Warlords Inn. She wants to aid the Empire. With Lara, I was initially worried that we were just going to get a repeat of what happened with Arizi Delaret in the Rogue Squadron books. But no, she was an Imperial spy, joins Race Squadron, realizes that these people really care about her, care what happens to her, and care what she has to say. And she doesn't want to be involved with the Empire in any way anymore. We'll get further development of her in Solo Command and how that decision will play out. But at this point in time, she's found new friends and unlike Face and Dia, she's not willing to look inward and look backward and deal with what she's done before. Then, like in Race Squadron, we have some deaths in Iron Fist. Alston had said that because these books are set during wartime, he didn't want it to be that everyone makes it out and that the only people that die are secondary characters with no emotional relevance on the plot. He wanted the deaths to be meaningful in some way. So we have two deaths, one that I feel is very emotionally meaningful both to the reader and to one of the characters I just talked about, and another one that while I didn't get the same emotional resonance, it felt really real to me in a way that some of the deaths in the Star Wars books haven't because it was so unexpected and sudden and you felt like this character hadn't fulfilled all their potential yet. So the first death we get is Ton Fanon. Tan had talked briefly with Face before this battle, basically that the Tawn, who was a rebel doctor during the Battle of Endor, and the Tawn that's now a starfighter pilot are like two completely different people. Younger Dr. Tawn Fanon was very hopeful, was sure that he was helping the galaxy, he was doing the right thing. But Fanon has an allergy to Bacta, so every time he's injured, they can't just dunk him in the tank, he loses more of himself. To the point that he feels like he can't connect with people, because so much of him is gone. Like Face, he's really beating himself over what has happened before, but unlike Face, he's given up. To the point that when his TIE fighter is shot down, Face goes after him, Face finds him, he talked to Face, he needed to let Face know about some things, and then he's just gone. He didn't want to live anymore. He also leaves a will, which spurs Face on further to put the past behind him and live for the present and the future, because he wills Face a lot of money with the condition that Face has to finally remove his facial scar, which was the one thing that he was really using almost as a crutch. Yes, I'm the Face and I did bad things and it shows on my face. But Fanon was right. Face doesn't have a back to allergy. There's nothing stopping Face from just moving on with his life. Originally, Alston planned to kill Fanon in Race Squadron in the battle that Jesmyn Akbar died. But he said that he knew that Fanon needed to be around and needed to influence some other characters. And it didn't take him until Iron Fist when he realized how closely Face and Fanon's subplots were tied together. And it hurts. It really hurts to see him die like that. And I'm not alone because if you go on fanfiction.net, an archive of our own, there are stories that are essentially fix it fix where Fanon doesn't die, okay? He and Face can just continue to have their bromance forever and ever. And then we have another death, which is 
not as emotionally moving as Tan Fanon's, but is almost more shocking in a way. Caston Dawn joins the race as their slicer. He's got issues to work through, mainly that he's not good with aliens. He grew up in an environment where he only encountered humans and that's something he has to deal with. He's also not good at hearing the word no. He has a plan to insert a code into Iron Fist that would broadcast its location so that General Solo's fleet can find it. Wedge says, that's a great idea, Kasten, but you need to think about this further. We're not going to risk it right now. Of course, Kasten doesn't do that. He sneaks aboard their shuttle when the Hawk Bats are meeting with Warlord Zinge. He gets his program inserted. He discovers Warlord Zinge has a secret lab where they're perhaps doing to aliens what was done to Vort, aka Piggy. He tries to help and he gets captured. And then Face is given the impossible choice of, do we kill him and preserve our cover identities, or do we just try to take out as many of Zinja's people as possible? Dia makes that choice for him by killing Kasten, and it leads to a huge breakdown for her that leaves her suicidal. So with Kasten Dawn, his death feels so shocking because it feels like his plot line hadn't been concluded. He still had stuff to work through, he still had things to do, but he's reckless and it directly led to his death and almost ruined their mission in the process. We get to interact with the rogues a little bit in this one because now the rogues and the race are technically based out of the same fleet, although the race are coming and going in their guise of the Hawkbat pirates. We get to see Han, who is doing a pretty good job being a general, even if he's not comfortable in the uniform. And then we have our baddies. If Warlord Zinj was more of a off-screen puppet master in Race Squadron, we see a lot more of him this time around. He's definitely a large ham in that he needs attention, he needs validation. He's very smart, but he also likes to play it up to an unreasonable degree. So you can sort of see how Alston is taking the Zinge that we saw in The Courtship of Princess Leia, but trying to perhaps make him a more realistic arch-villain. We also are reintroduced to General Melvar, who also appeared in the Courtship of Princess Leia. He seems sort of scary, and I'm not talking about his razor-sharp fingernails, but also the way that he plays a role. But unlike Zinj, it's not a particularly pleasant one. I also just have to call out the return of Lieutenant Ketch, who is set up in Race Squadron as like a throwaway joke. When Wes, Jansen, and Wedge are meeting all the potential pilots, Wes ends it by going, oh, and now we have a Ketch. He's a pilot from Endor. And Wedge is just like, no, no, no. Wes introduces a stuffed life-size Ewok who just happens to be in their starfighter, falling out of a closet on them, sort of continuing what Grinder had done in the first book. But then they take a step further because as the Hawk Bats, Cast and Dawn is able to alter the voice that goes out over their communication devices, and so just for fun, he makes Wedge's be an Ewok voice. Which then leads to Face having to come up with a backstory for Lieutenant Ketch, which is very similar to Piggy's backstory. And Wedge now has to fly pretending to be the Ewok pilot. And Zinge is very interested in Ewok pilots, and this will play even more of a role in Solo Command. I feel like I've said that several times now. If Iron Fist suffers from anything, it's that it's the middle book in a trilogy. It's definitely building towards things, but I felt like, for instance, the climactic battle at the end of the book wasn't as thrilling or actually climactic as the battle in the end of Race Squadron was. We know that Warlord Zinj is going to make it away to face another day because number one, there is one more book. And number two, we know he also makes it away to face another day in the courtship of Princess Leia. So we've got a lot of good character development, a lot of really good humor, but it also feels like Alston is building towards a big climax, but we won't see that for another book. 
I also felt like too I expected there to be resolution with the hawk bat plotline, mostly because that was what happened in Race Squadron. They pretended to be one of Zinja's ships until finally the ultimate battle in the end and then they weren't going to be pretending that anymore. So I guess I expected Alston to follow the same template, that they would become the hawk bats, they'd make a name for themselves as the hawk bats, Zinj would approach the hawk bats, they'd have the climactic battle and then their cover's blown and now they have to do something else. But it does seem like while Zinj is aware that one of the pirates sold him out, he's not yet sure who, so the hawk bats will live to see another day. And then two minor quibbling notes. Number one, I wish that Caston Dawn was not named Caston Dawn because his last name Dawn is just way too close to Min Donos. And while that won't affect book number three, it was a little confusing sometimes. That's the risk you run when your character's names are just way too similar to each other. Second, I found it interesting that we lost three pilots in Race Squadron. Two were alien, one was human. Two were women, one was a man. And they get replaced in Iron Fist with four pilots. Three are women, one's a man, which is great. I always love when we get to boost the number of women in the squadron because it always feels like they're outnumbered by men and having counted for a while how many women were in the books until I got a little sad and disappointed, it's always good for me to see more of them. However, of our four new pilots, only one is an alien and the other three are all human. And that was just one thing where it felt like we were almost missing out on some needed diversity. The aliens we have in Race Squadron are great, but the galaxy is a really big place. And while I'm sure that there's loads of humans everywhere, there's also loads of different aliens. So it's always a little disappointing when an alien character dies and gets replaced by a human character when I just wish there was a little more variety there. But on the whole, I think that Iron Fist was exciting and it was honestly really, really funny in parts. It didn't have a lot of the setup that Race Squadron had to put in place, but it does suffer a little bit from middle book syndrome, where Alston is getting things in place for the final climactic conclusion. However, on the whole, it was great. Recommend you read it, especially because I feel like the characters' emotional arcs are pretty well done. And unlike my feelings in some of the Rogue Squadron books where characters just died so that we could say, yeah, that was a tough battle, deaths really have meaning in Alston's books, and that's no more apparent than it is here in Iron Fist. So next time I will be reading the concluding book to the Hand of Thrawn duology by Timothy Zahn, Vision of the Future.